everyone. I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper, and welcome back to Build. The film Skin tells the story of a white supremacist who wants to reform his life but must betray his former gang and work alongside the FBI in order to do so. In our current political climate, well, where white nationalism and white supremacy make headlines almost daily, Skin takes a look at one man's journey from hate to healing. Today, I'm sitting down with director Guy Nativ, alongside actors Jamie Bell and Daniel McDonald, and anti racist activist Daryl Lamont Jenkins. But first, here's a trailer. Guys like this only have three options. Die young, life in prison, or they start talking. Not on our American soil! You let right them leave! It's our last gig. Why? I don't want my kids to be around this. Hey, Pops! What you looking at? You. We don't tolerate stupidity. Got that? Yes, sir! Do you have one that you regret? Some. Why, you got one you regret? Um, what was your first one? Fred gave it to me. He took me in. I owe him. I think real family don't make you owe shit. So you a family man now. Listen, talk to me, fams. You know the bad kids ain't gonna like it. You're better than those racists. I don't know what to do. In this business, you've got to stay focused or fall right down the rabbit hole. What if I take all this stuff off and I'm still a piece of shit? You have an out, Brian. I can help you. You don't answer your phone, you don't show up in meetings anymore. I don't even know if you remember. You need to get the kids and get out of here. It's time for you to come back home. I'm not going back. No, you have no choice. This is my family! You're still breathing because I own you. Every inch of ink on me. Is it true what Desi said? That you're an evil man. Please put your hands together for Guy Nativ, Danielle McDonald, Jamie Bell, and Daryl Lamont Jenkins. Hey guys, how you doing? We're good. How are you? We're good. I'm good. Doing good. How are you? <laughs> you guys Very can good. talk. Guys. You can say good. Well, uh, this is a pretty packed house. So we want to hear you, um, Guy. I want to start with you. Um, this film has had a long journey, and so for those who are unfamiliar, can you just take us back to the beginning of this story and, and why you wanted to tell it? Yeah, I was sitting in a coffee shop in Tel Aviv reading the newspaper and saw this um, crazy article about Brian Widener and the redemption story of his life, and I was blown away. And it was 10 years ago, and I moved to the States. I uh, married my now wife, uh, Jamie Newman, who is also the producer of the film. And, you know, I, I met with Brian and his wife, and I started reading, uh, writing the script, and no one wanted to tell this story in the US. It was like five years ago. So uh, I made a short before, because every feature I, I've done in Israel was a short before, and you know, it's to make the feature happen. And uh, then Trump got elected, Charlottesville happened, and a lot of crazy stuff happened in the States. So, and you know, that's where every star everything started. And Trudy Styler, Celine Retre and Orn Moverman uh, were the producers with a lot of um, balls and vision, and they jumped in to tell this story. And then where I met Jamie and Danielle, and they came on board. Yeah. And as you mentioned, uh, this is based on a real man. Yeah. Who, Daryl, you are in the film. You're the real Daryl. Yes. But there's yes. a fictional Daryl. Yes. <laughs> Mike Coulter plays me. You might know him from Luke Cage. He played the title character. And uh, it's just all a whirlwind right now. But yeah, it, um, Brian came to me, or rather, um, Juliet came to me originally. And um, when we started talking, we basically started talking music because that's the life that we both came from, really. I mean, that's once we was able to break the ice that way, just by talking about the kinds of music we liked and where we had that bond, it was just easy to talk about the other things that we were all concerned about because he was trying to get out at that time and 
I was just more or less a guiding light for him. I think it's really rare to have a story that is this dynamic at a time where we're seeing these themes play out in real life than to have the real men be a part of it. I mean, that's such a special process. Jamie, for you, how did that help you get into character, having the real man as kind of an entry point and to be able to talk to him? Yeah, I mean, I think whenever you play a real person, you, you do have a responsibility to go to that person and, uh, and uh, introduce yourself and hear it from their own mouth before you hear it from a filmmaker or from a screenwriter. So I did. I, I, I went up to visit him. He smokes an insane amount of cigarettes. Uh, and I said, you have to stop smoking cigarettes. So you're going to kill me. Uh, can we, can, and we would hang out in his garage. And I said, can we open the garage door? And he said, no, because I'm worried that someone might come by and shoot me. So that, that's when I kind of understood the, the level of um, paranoia that this man lives in, the kind of things that he's had to run away from, the, the, the things that he's reckoning with still. Um, you can read a script or you can see a documentary, but until you kind of see it up close and personal and ask those questions and see those responses, um, it's hard to really know it. So that was very useful for me. Yeah, I think when you look at a script, you're like, okay, it's a redemption story. He was a skinhead and now he's not, and what a journey. But then the film really takes you on that emotional and physical journey that this man has to go through. So I wanted to talk to you really quickly. For you as an actor taking on the role of a neo-Nazi skinhead um, emotionally, what sort of work did you have to do to be able to step into this role? Because it's such a loaded role. Mm. I mean, I... I to, to say that it is a redemptive story kind of gives the film an ending, and I don't think it does necessarily have an ending. I think what this film is trying to say is uh, racism and bigotry and intolerance is learned behavior. Um, no one is born a racist. It is something that you inherit. Uh, at the end of this film, uh, the character Brian meets his uh, son for the first time. And the question is, you can take, because the, the, the character Brian goes through a process of treatment to remove um, these tattoos from his face, um, which kind of gives him a whole new lease on life. Because uh, when I met him, I would never know that he had these tattoos. I mean, it's a, it really is kind of an immaculate job. But the question is, you can take it off of the skin, but what changes inside? And what are you going to give to your to the future generation? You, how is this, this new child, what's he going to learn? Is he going to inherit the same things that Brian did? So for me, that, that, those were the kind of interesting um, topics and, and, and kind of conversation starters and questions that this film was asking. And I appreciated that more than anything. That's it. Similarly, Danielle, you play Brian's wife, who for him was sort of the catalyst in, in many ways for his change. So what kind of work did you get to do on the front end? Did you get to speak with her or speak with him about her and just the emotions she had through this? Because she is a mother and that always came first for her, but she fell in love with this man who was bringing a lot of trouble into her life. Um, I wasn't able to meet with her before we started filming, no, but I, I did talk to Brian, I talked to Guy and Daryl when we were on set and asked questions. Um, that was that was kind of my in to her, but yeah, I it was honestly mother first. That was how she got out. It was the love for her children and that was really what I focused on. Um, and then I guess the relationship was all just kind of work that we put in together. You talked about um, nobody's born racist. Mm. And I want to go back to you because in the short film, there seemed to be more of a focus on this white nationalism being passed down genetically through a family. This sort of shows how young, impressionable men and women are kind of recruited into this world. So can you talk to me about why that became kind of the focal point of his intro entry into racism in this film? Well, when I met Brian, he told me about, um, you know, how everything started. And he was a 14-year-old boy who was thrown from his house. Uh, his mother was, um, you know, she died. And her fa his father just told him to call him every uh, month to tell him that he's still alive. So, and then he was kind of like got home um, from, you know, he was recruited by those people that gave him a sense of family and gave him food. And I saw that as a kind of a, you know, <clears throat> subject that continued to, to, it doesn't matter if it's ISIS or if it's like, uh, you know, skinhead neo-Nazis or if it's something else, it's all about education. It's all about this specific age when they, they are those kids who are basically like a, like a sponge, you know, they, they inhale every information that they've been given uh, are becoming those brainwashed kids and, and damaged. Daryl, is that something that you can speak to even more? Um, because you are obviously in this field of activism every day trying to help these men and women turn their lives around. So is that something you see very commonly is how they're recruited into this world? 
I see that not just from my work in politics and activism and such, but I also see it in my day to day because my parents were um, did this kind of work too in another fashion. My father was a drug counselor, as mentioned in the movie. My mother is an elder in the church, and both of them are known for counseling people who are trying to get out of their demons, trying to get out of their addictions. So it came second nature to me. But just like, say, my father would tell you that if you want to get off drugs, for example, um, you have to want it. You have to come to him. And that's the same here with uh, when I'm dealing with white supremacists or gangbangers, for that matter. Um, if you want to get out of that scene and you want my help, you have to come to me. I'm not going to chase you around um, try, uh, trying to tell you that there's a better way when you're not looking for a better way. Unfortunately, that means if you're not looking for that better way, I'm Antifa. I'm going to fight you. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, I didn't have to deal with that. Wasn't the case with Brian. Brian wanted to get out, and I was there for him. Yeah. And you know, Jamie mentioned the danger that Brian's still in. That these men and women are still in, even though they choose to leave that life behind. Um, do you think that's one of the reasons so many people stay in? No, I think the reason why so many people stay in is because they need that. Because some believe in it unfortunately, but some of them need that dynamic, that group dynamic. They need that sense of belonging. They need to make sure that their lives are worth a damn. So this is the only thing that they know that made it so. I mean, it actually reminds me of, um, of two brothers that, we've, that I've known over the past year. When I first saw them, um, they were really just like worn out. They looked very worn out, dark circles under their eyes, and they called themselves Nazis and such, but they weren't really involved yet um, as, as much as they wanted to be. By the time Charlottesville happened six months later, I saw them that they were the picture of health because they was rolling with their crowd. Unfortunately, one is in jail and the other committed suicide. So... It shows you just how much it impacts on life in a negative fashion and why I am so dedicated to make sure that this element is eradicated off the face of the earth. Is. And Guy, for you, uh, what is the line of painting an accurate picture of this world um, but not glorifying? Because he, like you said, some people could watch this and be like, yeah, I want to be a part of that, that group. Is that something you had to think of as you were putting the film together? Totally. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, it was, it was, I was very adamant about um, making um, uh, kind of a, like a cinematic approach of, of showing their lives as like um, not like uh, almost like dark and, 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 and bad and, and not flashy with bikes and with, you know, it's like um, I, I wanted to show how their life is grim and, and pathetic in a way. And nothing is glorified in in, the, in showing how they live the other way around. I, th I don't think any neo-Nazi would see that and say, you know, this is cool. Yeah. Especially then how those choices stick with them for the rest of their lives. Let's talk about the tattoos, Jamie. Mm. Because they are almost their own character in the film. They're so important to Brian's story. Um, so what was the process for you like getting those tattoos on every day? And did that help you really kind of like become him or kind of dig into his intentions or his thoughts a little more? Yeah, I mean, because also each tattoo really means something quite significant, usually not something very good. Yeah. Um, uh, it was a chance for him to intimidate people, to scare people, to therefore isolate himself um, from the world more. Um, these are kind of, they're in a way, kind of tribal markings of your successes at uh, attacking marginalized people. Um, so, you know, this man has been given a true gift to have that removed from his, his face and, 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 and his hands and, and it's because of the people um, like Daryl here and, and the donation, because he couldn't afford the, the, the removal because the surgery to remove it is extremely expensive. It also took two years for it to be completely uh, cleaned up. He couldn't afford that. So it was the, the generosity and the kindness and compassion of a complete stranger mm -hmm. to offer up this money that he's able to now live a completely different life. The process of putting them on was, you know, three and a half hours if it was just the, ha the, the face and the hands and five and a half if it was like full body. And on a budget of our size is insane because you're eating up so much of your shooting there with that. Um, but I, I would wear them out, like I'd wear them around town. 
And it's interesting, like human beings as a, as a species, we want to look away from things that are frightening. We, we want to pretend like it isn't there. What our movie is doing, and I know it's tough, and it sounds quite tough, I'm sure, is we're asking you to unflinchingly look at something that is real, that exists. I hope this film is, is, a, is a, a wake up call to a degree for this country. I got to hear a little bit more about you going out in public with these tattoos. Were there any, I mean, you were talking about people looking. Were there any run-ins? Did you feel differently? Like, what did that do for your experience? Well, I know how people feel about Nazis, and I feel the same way about them. I would go to the, you know, you know I mean, I'm not a confrontational person. That What Daryl does is a phenomenal effort, and we should all be doing what he's doing, is really confronting them in the streets, eye to eye. Um, but I'm just not that brave. Um, but... Uh, so our budget didn't really stretch too far. So there was a certain point where at the end of a week, I would say, God, I'm so excited to take off these tattoos and like go and have a really nice shower and get, get rid of this kind of horribleness. And uh, my makeup guy was like, uh, yeah, about that. Uh, we've, we've run out of money. You're going to have to keep them on. I was like, what do you mean keep them on? He's like, well, we, we don't have any, we can't print anymore. Like we've run out of cash. You're going to have to stick with these. We're going to have to like keep, keep these on until the end of the movie. So I would like, no one would want to hang out with me. And have to like eat I mean, completely they'll tell. alone. They'll tell where in the hotel. <laughs> yeah, but it was. I mean, it was. It's, it was interesting. We everyone like really understood how important this film is. How um, in the headlines this stuff is right now. How it's filling cable news cycles every day. I think we all very consciously knew um, what we had to do, um, and we all kind of lived with it, which was kind of icky. But I'm glad we did. Daniel, you're nodding your head. Is that something that you guys put into your performances? like what was going on in the country? Yeah, I mean, Jamie and I spoke about it when we first met up in LA before we even went to shoot the movie. We we went through everything and what it means and what the film is asking. It was an important question to ask ourselves if we were going to do it. And like Jamie said, we were, we were all in a hotel together for the entire shoot. It felt like some weird kind of camp, like in a way, but <laughs> we were all living with it together, you know, and it was like our every day and so... It really felt like the world of it. Yeah. yeah, I'm interested too. From your character's point of view, he has this face full of tattoos, but she's still able to see his heart mm -hmm. or to find the redeeming qualities in him. Um, again, was that something that you came to naturally, or is it something you really had to think about the psychology of his partner? Um, I mean, yeah, I definitely thought about the psychology, and I, I like part of me was like, how, right. how? I kept saying how, why? Yes, how and why, and that was, honestly, I kept saying that. I kept saying that to Guy before I started. I was like, how, why? But, I mean, she grew up with it. That was what she knew. It was comfortable in a way. So, and she saw the heart that she didn't see growing up with. So even though he had that, it was like he also had a heart. And Jamie helped with that. You know, Jamie was always like nice Jamie around me. He was never like scary Jamie that he was with the Vinlanders. So that that was honestly really helpful and like, yeah. yeah I, th I think we were always kind of trying to rationalize the motivations and actions of people that are irrational. Mm. And I think that's what Guy really understood because he'd hung out with Brian so much and uh, he was so kind of intimate with him and his family. He was like, you, you stop trying to rationalize the actions, the motivations. They're not like you. Like, you, they don't operate like you. So a big reference for me was like Sid and Nancy, which is a very kind of toxic relationship. But to them, it makes perfect sense. In their world, they're in love and it's a fairy tale, yeah. you know? But I got to say something about Jamie and Danielle. I mean, their relationship is so human. And it's, you know, you, kept, you keep forgetting about how crazy their life is because they brought so much humanity into this role, you know. And they, and we sat in the hotel and they, you know, did a pass on the, on the, on the dialogue and on, on, on stuff that they brought to the character. So they brought so much, like, layer of humanity. And that's why it works um, in this specific... Yeah, I would argue and say that's the only reason it works because I obviously go in with my own point of view, very loaded, very angry through some of the film mm -hmm. and upset that I'm actually seeing the human side of this person, yeah. which is a testament to your guys' performance. But also then it's, it's widening my point of view of knowing people's entry points into racism and that everybody doesn't have the same intentions or, you know, people are just yeah. trying to survive sometimes. And the film really kind of poses the question, can these people be forgiven? It makes you ask yourself. It made me ask myself before I started because, you know, immediately it's like, no. And then it makes you broaden. It's like, how do we make a change in society then if we, we're not allowing people to change? It's, it's a complicated issue. It's really complicated. is. Daryl, how does that impact your work? Um, people, because I'm sure you get asked a question all the time, like, why, man, why are you doing this? 
They ask the question all the time. <laughs> um, I do it because it has to be done. I mean, the fact of the matter is we cannot go on like this. I mean, we see the political climate as it is, and it's not compatible with the future. So somebody's going to have to go out there and do it. Somebody's going to have to go out there and do it while people are telling them not to, because we get a lot of that. And the one thing that I take away from all of that is when we're successful in what it is we do, those same people will appreciate it. Those same people will say, um, thank you, or try to say that they were a part of it. <laughs> so, you know, I am confident in the fact that we are a better people than we give ourselves credit for. And when I look at um, this film and we talk about the humanity of these individuals, um, we it's all a mission to help them to see their humanity as well. And it's been successful to an extent. There's certain things that each of these individuals that I have dealt with over the past 20 some odd years still have to come to terms with. Um, it's not over for them. They still have a lot to atone for. They still have people that will always be angry at them for what they got themselves involved with. And that's something they're gonna have to carry with them for the rest of their lives. Um, the only thing we can do is recognize everyone else's concerns in regards to that first and foremost, um, but also help them along as they do transition into being better people. I mean, oh, you know. I, I, just, I just wanna say Daryl is a very humble man. He, Brian Widener is not the only person that he dealt with and helped. He helped at least 12 people uh, turn and become a better, a better person. Uh, but I also, he also a, a fighter. And he waits there in those junctions in the, in the streets and he fight them every single day, which makes him an amazing person that has a, a sliver in the door to forgive them or accept them. You mentioned fighting. I think the act of just sometimes showing their faces and that yes. can affect their work. I mean, I'll, I know some of the work that you guys have done and I think it's yes. very important. Yes, that's, a, that, that's key because these folks like to hide. These folks like to... Um, keep themselves undercover so that they can go through their day to day while at the same time trying to destroy all of theirs. And we're like, no, you're not doing that. Guy, before we go to audience questions, I know that this film is dedicated to your grandfather. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, my grandfather, uh, Ruben Monovich, was a Holocaust survivor and, you know, like the rest of my grandparents, and he taught me um, about tolerance, about, about dialogue, because he forgave, or didn't forgive, but he accepted the new generation of Germans, and and he said it's not the same, it's not the same people, and you know he taught us what what it is to um, accept and believe in in good. So he spoke to Brian Widener, and he gave me the kind of a green light to do this movie, and he said it's very important before he passed away. That's really powerful. Thank you. Hearing stuff like that, does that make you guys even more proud to be a part of a project that I think, you know, people have a lot of different opinions on, but knowing the kind of foundation and root of it? Yeah, there's no question. This is a film that is complex in its issues. Um, but it has a very interesting perspective, you know, certainly what, what Guy has just said. I mean, to, for him to focus his attentions on this, that you could have made a movie, really, but for him to focus on this kind of a film, I find very fascinating. It only invokes more questions, you know. I hope that it really does create much more of a dialogue. You know. It's kind of crazy that Israeli, Australian, British, True. and American <laughs> are doing film about America, yeah, which yeah. maybe allowed us to be a little bit kind of an outside. In, you know. Also, your accents were spot on, so well played. Thank you. Thank well you. played. Thank you. No, those aren't easy to get all the time. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, who do we have first? Hi, guys. Mm -hmm. Nice Hi. to meet you. First, I will sorry about my broken English. Hi. Israeli, obviously. Of course. Um, I will start. It will be a little bit a long story, but amazing story. Uh, so I'm a realtor, and my first, I, I met Jamie when she started to an apartment for uh, Beth, his wife. Oh, my God. Yeah, small, small world. So I just met Jamie. We found her apartment. Second story, when you look for an apartment to edit skin. So I try to help her to find an apartment. Nice to meet you guys. Hi. <laughs> so small world, obviously, after for your newborn. And uh, congratulations, Mazel Tov. I don't think you can get, uh, okay. like, you actually get trip, 
three prizes in a, almost in the she's same the, year, She's right? the biggest prize. Exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, to see her catch these two Oscars was amazing, obviously from Israeli eyes. But uh, actually the story is, is a real tour. I, I meet so many talented uh, artists all over the city. So most of them obviously come from Israel, well known. You obviously already had your, your prestige coming from Israel, start to build here your name. Uh, about pressure, about everything. You, uh, I check in Google, your last thing was like 2014. So I'm assuming you work, you work, meet a lot of people, meet a lot of stuff. And how you are like succeed, how you are like, you obviously bring it home. Like as you say, obviously I saw the Israeli, also Jamie was so proud to bring it to Israel. Uh, sorry about that part, but it is, for Israel it was a really amazing uh, story. But the most important, because I'm part of an uh, Israeli organization, IAP, Israeli Artist Project, and we try to support these artists, that to, just to give them the ground to stay in the city. City is so expensive. City is so hard, uh, definitely, when you're coming overseas. So what is the best uh, tips that they, you can give to these guys, you know, to uh, what help you in your way to uh, keep and fulfill your goals? And... Every, anything you can help them, you know, just uh, and me to give to guide them in the way. First of all, um, you know, it wasn't easy. I came to the states uh, five years ago, and it took me a while to get this story made. You know, and a lot of people said no. You know, there's a I have a friend who wrote a book uh, that says no, 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 yes, and that's what I experienced. I experienced no from every single producer, actor. Um, because they were afraid to to tell this story. It wasn't like commercial, you know. It wasn't um, a, a nice comedy, and it wasn't the, the. And I chose the hard route, but I got this um, frame from a from a good friend of mine. Who uh, in the frame there was a sentence, and there was sent the sentence said, uh, "You were once wild here. Don't let them tame you." It's Isadora Duncan, and it's and it's and they were right that I was I was you know, working hard to tell authentic stories. You know, I wanted to do the same stuff that I did in Israel, and that's our goal as filmmakers, as, as artists, to bring hard um, and, and complicated stories to the world. Like, you know, I grew up on, on films from the 70s when they, they did that, and, and we succeed with people who wanted to do the same with me, but it wasn't hard. It, it took me four and a half years to make it happen, and I went back and I went to do the short film first with my own money, with our own money. We put all our money into this uh, this film, and this film uh, was eventually what brought Jamie because Danielle was in the in the short, but it was it brought Jamie to see the work because nobody knew what I you know what I did in Israel, and it helped bring the producers. So it's all about hard work. And, and time, you need some time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen over a year. It's, it takes time. And you mentioned a little earlier that you guys had conversations uh, yourself about hesitations possibly going in. I mean, we have Billy Elliot and Dumplin'. These are very different roles. Iconic, iconic characters. Yeah, very different roles. So for you as an actor, I want to know, is doing a jump for a more serious sort of heavy film like this exciting? Or are you a little nervous about kind of changing what people view you as? Uh, I wasn't nervous about changing how people view me. I like doing different characters. I really enjoy that. Um, I like exploring different sides of myself and different issues. Uh, it was, the conversations were more about like, what are we trying to say in this film? That was really what concerned me the most, but I knew that guy was coming out from the right perspective. I, I knew- We made the short. I mean, the, the we short made head. the short yeah. before as well, which, Obviously, like I'd already worked with Guy, I already knew what the message was, and I knew that this was another side of it. But um, the short was a great experience for me to understand this world. That was where I first did all the research for it as well. So I had an understanding from that going into the feature. I, I, th I don't think I would have done this movie if if it wasn't. Um, I wouldn't have done the film if it wasn't exploring authentically the roots of evil, but it also explores the roots of compassion and kindness in equal measure. And hopefully the film is saying when those two things intersect, can it affect change? And will it affect change? Um, who knows? I fucking hope so. Because we're fucked right now. We're Sorry. So, we're so fucked right now. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? I think that was really, you're, yeah. you're right. 
I don't have anything else to say. I mean, but but uh, to be fair, to be fair, oh my God, to be fair, Jamie took his time to say yes. He had to digest it. He had, he said to me, "Look, I'm scared to do this, but it's a good thing because I I like to, to feel something before I'm going into." a role, a challenging role like that. So he took his time, he thought about that. I think when he saw that Daniel uh, signed on, he felt better because he's, he, you know, right? Yeah, well, she's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Awesome, yeah, everybody's great. Cool. <laughs> One last question. Um, this role couldn't be more different than your role in Rocket Man. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Use the mic. <laughs> okay. Sorry. sorry. Couldn't be more different than your role in Rocket Man, so it shows you an incredible range. Very sweet. Um, what, what was the one key element, if there was one key element, that, that helped find your way into the, this character? Um, I, re I really kind of saw, I mean, certainly in the early passages, you, hopefully you kind of guys are getting a sense of what the movie is overall, but in those early passages when we kind of first meet this character, he's been a career Nazi since he was 14 years old. He's now in a slew of alcohol and violence and and reward, and that cycle continues. So th to a degree, he is kind of unconscious. I think he's kind of losing, comp he's lost complete track of what he even stands for or what their hateful ideology even is. A lot of what the Vinlanders, specifically their ideology is, to be frank, utter garbage. It's just utter nonsense. It's like Vikings and bloodlines it, it literally just absolute insanity, just complete nonsense. Um, so for me, the, the journey of the character was one of awakening. It's about coming to consciousness, coming to like, actually, I don't really buy any of this. And actually, what have I done with my life? And is it too late to get it back? The hardest thing, I think, to really tap into was just a, a level of detachment. Detachment from compassion, detachment from empathy, detachment from love, companionship. It's just not who I am as a person. I mean, I, it's the antithesis of who I am as a person. So inhabiting that and kind of walking around with that, on top of the fact that you look like a monster, literally, um, you, just wearing that every day was extremely um, disheartening and uncomfortable and unpleasant. Um, you know, I, like for example, I, you know, actors always talk about like, you can just check it at the door. Like, or, or, or was it really difficult for you to like lose a character when you finish working on it? And I always thought like, I don't really buy that shit. Like you're putting on a costume and the tattoos are fake and you, uh, and when you rap in the day, that's it, you're done. And I thought I was quite good at that. But then I got home after we finished shooting and like a week or something later, my wife was like, you need to go like, just take a jog or like walk it off. Because you're so you're you're so hostile, you're so charged, and I was completely unaware. So, you know, I take her word for it over mine. But um, I would say that stuff was certainly the hardest part to to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, Daryl, after people watch this film, they may feel some sort of way. They may want to increase their activism. They may want to be more involved. So, what do you say to people like that who have maybe found a new compassion in watching this, or they want to help be a part of the solution? Um, they can come talk to me for one thing, um, but um, aside from that, I just ask people to become more aware of what's been going on over the past several years, and be um, and, and join your groups. You don't necessarily have to be out in the streets like I am. I mean, you can be home, going through your day to day. Um, be educated on the current events, be educated on who's doing positive stuff and who's doing negative stuff, and talk with your communities and talk with your uh, family and friends and say, how do we make sure we don't fall down that rabbit hole? How do we keep ourselves from becoming consumed by the hatred and bigotry that we have been seeing over the past just two and a half years alone? Um, because it is ugly out there. Fucked? No. I'm sorry. I I think that we may have some issues out there, but we can handle it. We have handled it before. We have handled worse before. And we just have to go back to what it was that beat that back the first time, and we'll be all right. That's why we need more people like Daryl Lamont Jenkins in the <laughs> world. So, you're like, it's over. <laughs> and the Every over. optimist I am. <laughs> <laughs> we need that, <laughs> for sure. But uh, I just want to say that our next project, next next project is uh, from Daryl Lamont Jenkins' point of view. And we're going to, we are uh, working on that right now with the same group of 
partners. So that was honestly going to be my tag is that it was so interesting for me to view it from this point of view. And it made me even more interested in the work that Daryl has done. Um, and it just made me look for other ways that I could be more involved and more compassionate and have more productive conversations. So again, I think this film is really beautifully made, beautifully acted, but the messaging is something that I think is going to resonate with a lot of people, especially now. So thank you. Thank you all. Skin, thank you. Skin yeah. thank Hit you. Theaters on July 26th. Please put your hands together for Guy Nativ, Danielle McDonald. Thank Gary you guys. Bell, thank you for Darryl being Lamont. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.